So as Mark mentions, my name is Ezekiel Zilberberg. Uh, I head up product development efforts over at Akron. And I'll give you a quick sense for, for the organization and some of the exciting things that have been under development in the last couple of months. But first, just to frame the talk, I know that we, we have been discussing and we will discuss a variety of challenges and, and opportunities that the allogeneic modality really presents. Uh, really on the challenges front, we've talked a lot about allo-reactivity and a lot of the patient-related issues that we need to resolve and address moving forward, issues relating to persistence and, and optimal dosing and delivery strategies. But really the, the core of my talk where I really want to focus is a lot of the challenges on the manufacturing front, where I think a lot of uh, a lot of work is being done today uh, by several therapy developers and also on the ancillary materials side to ensure that we're delivering the core products that really uh, allow for the development of these therapeutics uh, to be established in a, in a timely and, and cost-effective fashion. So that's ultimately our goal uh, at Akron. Now, just to give you a quick sense for where the organization's been, um, we, we were really founded in 2006, and the focus initially was very much on the provision of GMP-compliant cytokines to support cell and gene therapy production. We really established ourselves on the basis of our interleukin 2, 7, 15, 21, and, and very quickly kind of grew the portfolio out, uh, focusing on cryopreservation, and, and ensuring that we could deliver these therapies uh, with, with a sufficient degree of viability of functionality post-manufacturing to really be useful. Um, and also on the human plasma-derived side, so making sure that we were able to develop and establish uh, human plasma-derived products that were safer uh, than what we had previously been using. And so for that reason, we really established uh, an exclusive partnership with Octopharma uh, earlier this year to ensure that we could deliver AB serum derived from virus inactivated uh, human plasma that ensures greater batch to batch consistency and, and a safety profile than what we would typically see out of, out of products in the space. Now, a lot of this growth was accelerated by the acquisition of Akron by Arcline uh, in 2019. And so what that really allowed us to do is on the one hand, make sure that we were building up the regulatory uh, support to enable uh, advanced therapy development through late stage clinical trials and through the commercial. And we've done that really by establishing a number of ECTD format master files with CBER uh, and also building a lot of the, uh, the, the validations behind our products that allow us to support late stage uh, companies. We also did that by bringing online uh, a, a CGMP compliant plasma DNA manufacturing facility, which will actually be uh, online later this year and manufacturing under GMP into next year. Uh, and we're doing that with a variety of partners. I'll talk a little bit about that in a little while. Um, and, and really we're, we're looking forward to continued growth in this space on the basis of, of the portfolio we've established historically and a lot of what we're doing now. Now, our team has also grown uh, considerably through the year. So we've brought a variety of industry veterans like David Smith, Who's, who's joined us from, from Lonzo and Helios, uh, Rob Margolin, who's been in the space for quite some time, and then folks that have spent a lot of time in the pharmaceutical space, including uh, Ian Hart, our new VP of operations, John Coyle on the quality and regulatory front, Balwant Patel, Sebastian Almeida. So we're really growing the team in order to be able to support uh, more advanced therapy production, especially uh, once firms reach late stage clinical trials and need a lot more uh, support on the CMC front. We've also grown our scientific advisory board. So we've really established this in the last couple of months and have grown it considerably in a very short period of time. Uh, folks like Anthony Davies, Sylvia Donert, Mark Bognati, Bruce Levine, Jerry Ritz, and Isabel Revere uh, have joined us. So uh, really uh, insightful discussions and a lot of support as we continue to optimize our ancillary materials to support uh, these therapeutic modalities. So just really to dive into the core of it, because to us, uh, really looking at this from the supply chain, we really view a lot of the challenges that are facing allogeneic cell therapy developers, much like autologous uh, cell therapy developers, as those relating to supply chain. And I think uh, we all think these days about COVID and the way that that's impacted our supply chains. But in reality, I think the primary uh, way or the primary driver for building a resilient supply chain is to really meet the needs uh, that are presented by upside events. So we all know a lot of the data. Uh, you can hardly see it here because it's a little bit pixelated, but in general, we know that there are a lot of clinical trials ongoing in the space. 
We're seeing more and more uh, trials on the allogeneic side as well that we think are going to continue growing. And so we see that this increased uh, really just throughput through the clinical pipeline is going to require more and more robust supply chains, especially once we're manufacturing under large scale uh, uh, operations. And also, obviously, the downside events that we're all well aware of by now in terms of COVID-19 and how that's impacted the space in particular. We know that most cell therapy and gene therapy companies have been affected and continue to be affected in this way. And so this is something we're all living with and all working through, whether it's you know, on the consumable side with bags and vials and stoppers, or whether it's on the core input side and on donors and being able to get folks in and out of clinical settings where we need them to be, when we need them to be there. So really building a resilient supply chain for us is about both meeting the, the demands of the upside and the really the complexities that the downside present. And what I want to really focus on here is three different ways that we think about uh, building resilient supply chains and how we uh, support uh, the construction and the maintenance of these supply chains. The first is really on standardization. So in, in this counterintuitive sense, standardization actually increases flexibility. It increases your degrees of freedom, especially as you design your supply chain or, and are able to weave in new suppliers, ensure that the modules in your system can connect well and that you have interoperability throughout. Um, so in this counterintuitive sense, the less and less degrees of freedom you have, the more and more flexibility you actually are able to build into your system. And we believe that strongly, which is why we work with our customers to ensure that we provide solutions that, that are scalable uh, and that are useful across the industry and that are interoperable with what other suppliers may be doing. And the second is that, especially as we see the shift from autologous to allogeneic coming online, we see that uh, we're moving from more of a bespoke type modality to something that is off the shelf. And so by simplifying the product architecture on the therapeutic side, you actually allow the supply chain to simplify as well, because you're able to move from a kind of uh, complex logistical network of donors receiving manufactured treatments to campaign-based manufacturing that more closely resembles what we traditionally see in biologics and in small molecules. So from a supply chain standpoint, you're able to create more clearly codified and defined inputs that allow you to actually scale your, scale your process. So the way that we've supported standardization is on the one hand at the industry level, we really were deeply involved in the foundation of the standards coordinating body. And we believe very strongly that it's important for us to generate standards that are appropriate to the space. It's not the most uh, exciting space to, to be sometimes, but if you, if you really don't invest the time and effort to codify a lot of the interfaces between your ancillary material provider, your raw material provider, your manufacturing services provider, and the clinical setting, you can actually fall into a trap where you, you actually lose uh, information throughout, lose potentially chain of custody, chain of identity, and really need to uh, rework that. So we think that standardization is actually going to be one of the key drivers of lowering cost of goods and ensuring uh, fewer errors uh, as we continue to scale this industry. But also on the product side. So I just want to highlight our portfolio of, of GMP compliant cytokines. As I mentioned earlier on, we've been manufacturing IL-2, 715, 21 for a very long time and have master files that have now been referenced by FDA in relation with customers. Uh, filings, uh, especially in approved products. Um, and we're moving more and more of these cytokines into liquid format. The IL-2 has been in liquid format for some time, and we're moving the others as well, uh, especially into closed system uh, opportunities that allow you to, to maximize uh, the system closure on the manufacturing front. Um, but really, in terms of standardization for us, one of the key often overlooked parameters is biological activity or specific activity and how we measure and report this. For IL-2, for a very long time, what we've done is we've pursued a parallel line approach, uh, measuring against the NIBSC standard for IL-2, and we do this when, when international standards are validated and available globally. And what this does, rather than measuring ED50s or comparing ED50s, this allows us to have a greater degree of accuracy and consistency in how we measure and report specific activity from lot to lot. And what that comes out to at the end of the day is, is a fairly kind of simple and overlooked but critical uh, competitive advantage for us, which is being able to generate lots that are consistent where our customers on the other end can uh, have a greater degree of reliability in terms of how much material they're going to need in their own manufacturing processes. So this in particular is just an example 
so that you can get a sense for how the lot trending data works for, uh, for our IL-2 syringe in particular, which is our liquid IL-2. So we think that actually biological activity measurement and reporting is one of these critical pieces where if you're able to actually standardize the way that these are done, uh, you would A, you know, be able to ensure greater batch to batch consistency on the manufacturing front, which we all know is going to be critical, especially for allogeneic therapies, uh, but also be able to interchange or exchange different suppliers. Uh, the inability to create a viable crosswalk between different manufacturers because biological activity is measured and reported in such different ways makes it so that transition from one to the other is difficult. Now that's complicated if you're trying to onboard a secondary supplier for one of your critical cytokines. And so what we think we need to do is move towards more standardized measurements uh, of biological activity to be able to support interchangeability and ultimately allow for a more robust supply chain, especially for these critical inputs. The second is really on supply chain design and it's often overlooked, but it is a very critical competitive advantage and, and a core competency for therapeutic developers. Where does your supply chain begin and where does it end? How much are you going to internalize that classical economic make or buy decision? So the more and more time and effort that's put into this and how the supply chain is ultimately designed is going to be critical for ensuring that you're able to secure supply of critical inputs and minimize those single points of failure in the supply chain. So we really believe strongly that, that companies in our space, in the cell and gene therapy space in particular, where industry st structure is quite nascent, we're still working through what the, what the boundaries are going to be, how much uh, each supplier is going to take on and how much therapeutic developers want to internalize and how much they want to outsource. We really need to make sure that insofar as it's possible, we minimize those single points of failure to ensure that we're ultimately doing what matters most, which is developing and delivering these therapies to patients that don't have other options. So the way that we're looking at this as we establish our plasma DNA manufacturing facility is really being able to alleviate one of the critical bottlenecks in the space. We know that it's growing. Uh, I think it's been well recognized for quite some time that the availability of high quality plasma DNA is an industry bottleneck. And so we're seeing a lot more activity in this space by a variety of suppliers. And it's the reason that we're bringing on our facility later this year. So this is a 60,000 square foot facility, several independent air handling systems and segregated clean zones. We're gonna have USP water for injection and distribution loop uh, in place. And most importantly, perhaps on the production side, having the availability of both a 50 liter, 200 liter, and a couple of other disposable bioreactor lines in place that can operate concurrently is going to ensure that we can maximize quality and also throughput to be able to support, especially late stage clinical and commercial stage customers that really need both that quality, but also the volume to be able to deal with larger patient populations. So that's really where we are in terms of our development viewing uh, GMP coming online late this year and early next. And in terms of the systems we're bringing online, we're really building this with the top partners in our space, whether it's on the business side with Salesforce and SAP, on the security side to ensure data integrity with Azure, on the quality side, building a CFR, 21 CFR compliant trackwise system. We're on the equipment side where we've announced a partnership with Cytiva on the flex factory to ensure that we have the top of the line equipment for the space and are able to bring a facility that really brings high quality capacity on from day one. So what we really see is our, our competitive advantages as we bring this online is the focus on quality. We're implementing an EQMS that is aligned with pharma norms and uh, very much in, in line with regulatory requirements as well to be able to support not just uh, ex vivo uh, applications, but also in vivo gene therapies and, and vaccines as well. On the flexibility side, the fact that Acron you know, remains a, a, a company that is flexible and the business model was built on ensuring that customer requirements are heard, understood, processed, met, and delivered. That is something that we're gonna continue doing as we build our capabilities in the plasmid space. Bioprocessing expertise is at the very core of everything we do. We've obviously been developing and manufacturing recombinant proteins for quite some time. And a lot of that expertise that's built up over many, many years, a lot of the talent that's been brought online in the last year or two, uh, specifically with a focus on plasma DNA production and formulation, uh, is really going to allow us to jumpstart this unit and, and really 
become an industry leader in a very short period of time. And lastly, the fact that we are building a greenfield facility from scratch that focuses on this space. We are ensuring that the facility meets the specifications required for what it is producing, which in this case is plasma DNA under GMP compliance, and all the equipment vendors, providers, QMS facility team is really pushing to make sure that that is the focus. So more on this later this year, and we're more than happy to connect and discuss to make sure that your needs are met. And lastly, regulatory compliance. And uh, again, often overlooked, uh, especially in early stage settings, but uh, we think that the more that this is considered early on, the easier it is later on. Um, but obviously you do have to meet that balance of you know, regulatory requirements on the one hand and performance on the other. You don't want to sacrifice one for the other and you need to be able to maximize. And often the two aren't able to grow in tandem. So you really need to achieve a, an optimal balance. And the second is really on the regulatory filing side. So making sure that you have master files in place for your core ancillary materials to be able to support those late stage filings. So a lot of uh, the focus here for us has been not just on the DMFs and making sure that our products are properly documented per relevant regulatory authorities, but also on the way that these products are built from the ground up. And so to highlight one specific space where we have focused on this, and it comes back to the partnership I mentioned with Octopharma, by building our fibronectin, by building our AB serum on the basis of virus inactivated human plasma that has all the data on the viral log reduction factors that are critical for us to assure regulators that we do have a safe product and that isn't going to contribute undue risk into our manufacturing processes. Um, we have partnered with Octopharma to make sure that we are, we are building safe products from the ground up without sacrificing performance. So what we're finding more and more is for a virus inactivated AB serum, for example, and even for our fibronectin, we find that performance is on par with the top of the line products in the market. Uh, it's on par over time and that we don't take a hit, even though we are making a significant uh, uh, advance on the safety side. And so this is really a, a critical piece for us, achieving both a safe product that at the same time doesn't require you to sacrifice anything in terms of performance. So we're looking forward to building this product and this family of products more uh, in the years ahead. And lastly, on the, on the regulatory front, as I mentioned, we have made a concerted effort to ensure that we have master files in place with FDA, but also globally, ensuring that we get eligibility confirmation uh, from PMDA for our critical human-derived products to make sure they're eligible for use in Japan. Uh, so we're focusing on the US, we're focusing on Europe, and we're focusing on Japan, and servicing these master files on an annual basis and providing letters of authorization to, to organizations that really need that regulatory support. Uh, as much as possible. So uh, we're looking forward to building this portfolio out further in the months and years ahead and ensuring that we can uh, not just provide high quality products that are uh, consistent from batch to batch, uh, but also that the regulatory filings support their use in late stage trials. And so at the end of the day, what we've talked about is the need to build resilient supply chains. Of course, we know that there are a number of challenges in, in delivering on the promise of allogeneic cell therapy. Uh, obviously, there is all sorts of issues around alloreactivity, around donor selection, the potential of identifying uh, and, and working with super donors. Uh, there are certainly issues on the scale upside. There are issues on the manufacturing front. For us, what's critical is to ensure that we provide and we are part of building a supply chain that allows this industry to thrive. Uh, so part of that is going to be standardizing, making sure that inputs from one supplier to the next are really interchangeable, uh, because until that's the case, we are still going to be uh, at risk on the supply chain side. So we really need to make sure that we create viable standards throughout the industry, and more importantly, within the supply chain itself. So for us, that comes down to making sure that the concentrations of our products, the aliquots we provide them in, the ways that we measure and report biological activity are really aligned and that we transmit those and communicate those through the industry to make sure that we're all on the same page uh, to ensure that we can actually create a flexible system. Uh, because again, flexibility is not a matter of having all possible opportunities. Flexibility is more about actually limiting degrees of freedom so that you can maximize choice. On the supply chain design side, we think that ultimately 
this is a critical core competence and that more and more effort needs to be placed on onboarding, qualifying and working with both primary, secondary suppliers, even tertiary suppliers in some cases, to make sure that especially during these times where we are having downside disruptions on the COVID side, that we're able to mitigate those and bounce back and ensure that we're still able to deliver on these therapies that the patients so desperately require. And lastly, on the regulatory compliance side, and this for us comes down to ensuring that we have high quality products built from high quality raw materials from the ground up, uh, hence the focus on virus inactivated plasma derived products, and also on ensuring that the documentation that regulators have access to when reviewing filings are, uh, is uh, available uh, in a format that also provides uh, support for the ancillary material developer and manufacturer that needs to protect certain details regarding its CMC. Uh, so we think that the drug master file is actually a, an ingenious instrument for, for providing that. And in Japan, the eligibility confirmation and active substance master files in Europe. So we're looking forward to building more and more of that support as we move along. And with that, I'd just like to summarize. Uh, we know that the important points on the allogeneic side are going to be multifold, and we can do our part from the supply chain to support them. Um, and we look forward to working with folks in this space as we continue to grow and as the industry continues to grow uh, in order to ensure that the supply chain is not a constraint, but something that grows alongside the industry and supports innovation and a variety of downstream activities that we're really going to need to make a leap uh, if we're really going to deliver on the promise of these therapies. So very thankful for your time. Uh, look forward to any questions you might have. Uh, I have a couple of questions I have thought of as we're going along. I wanted to start off with. Um, I was very interested to see you have aisle seven, aisle fifteen, and aisle twenty-one, uh, as well as aisle two. And so, for, for many of us, those are our next top three um, cytokines. So, I was interested to know if, if you're getting significant demand for those already, and if you have other cytokines in mind. Yeah, yeah. So we we actually have seen the two seven and fifteen and twenty-one really drive demand for the most part in the in the T cell space, especially. <clears throat> And actually, a lot of what we're doing nowadays, and I didn't mention it much during the presentation, but is focusing on system closure on the manufacturing front. So we're moving all of these cytokines into liquid format. IL-2 and 21 are already available in shelf-stable liquid solution at 2 to 8 and have 24 months of stability behind them. So we're already able to support those products. Uh, and 7 and 15 are coming in the next few months. The next piece that's important for us, because depending on the quality department you're talking to, um, uh, you know, syringes can or cannot be considered uh, functionally closed. And so what we've been moving towards is uh, actually bags that permit uh, weldable connections uh, with shelf stable liquid in them to ensure that you can actually pump in the concentration or desired amount of IL-2, 7, 15, and 21 you need for your process and then be able to kind of pull it out of the refrigerator, use it, weld again onto the bag if you need to. But otherwise, especially on the allogeneic side, really optimize the concentration and the volume you need <clears throat> to be able to use these in larger campaigns, uh, which is really what we're targeting to support uh, colleagues in the allogeneic space. So uh, two is actually launching in the next couple of months. Uh, we are actually working through uh, final iterations and uh, seven and 15 will be coming out shortly thereafter. Great, thank you. And this is presumably one situation where you as um, provider and, and facilitator, you're very much involved in the, um, the work with the, your, your um, colleagues and your um, companies you're working with. So I was interested to know if you probably know a little bit more than some people would know about what's the end use of the product. Um, so would you say that Aloe is really taking off now in terms of demand for your products? Yeah, I, and you know, I, I think we're starting to see a lot more of it pick up. Uh, obviously, you know, the, the, the autologous approaches to, to CAR T and even to NK cell therapy are, are quite advanced. Um, and so we're seeing a lot more volume demand there. And, and the thing is, we've, we've always kind of, we've established ourselves in a place where we would have the scale and capacity to meet the needs of commercial uh, customers. So manufacturing uh, gram scale batches, um, which is a tremendous amount of you if you're talking about most of these proteins. Um, but over time, what we're seeing is that shift where folks are really starting to think about kind of the cost of goods associated with shifting from metologous to allogeneic therapy. Obviously, you have to consider dosing and how that changes when you move from metologous to, to allogeneic, especially uh, the persistence of some of these allogeneic therapies. Um, 
but I think that the fact that you're going to potentially need several doses of an allogeneic product, the fact that you're going to need to manufacturing campaigns uh, means that we, we are prepared to, to support this industry moving forward. We think that this is going to grow. Uh, at the moment, it's still, I would say, quite nascent uh, in terms of, of demand relative to the autologous therapies. Um, but we think that once we, we really start to nail down some of these larger questions uh, in terms of the safety and efficacy of these therapies, uh, we're going to see this tick up. And actually, a lot of the work that we've done, and, and I didn't talk about it here, but we've done a lot of work with our colleagues over at Georgia Tech on really modeling some of the, the COGS differences and some of the different models whereby allogeneic and autologous uh, modalities differ and how we can model different production systems and how it impacts volumes uh, of ancillary materials, uh, the integrity of the supply chain. And some of that work is, is hopefully uh, to be published later this year. We've been a bit delayed due to COVID, but, um, but we've done a lot of work to understand how you model the supply chain for an allogeneic process and how that can really impact ultimately what the cost of goods looks like and what that differential is between the allogeneic and the autologous. Because uh, ultimately that's gonna be one of the big selling points, right? Being able to drive down the cost considerably without sacrificing too much on the, on the efficacy side. Great, thank you. I have a couple of questions from the audience. Um, and you know, I understand if some of them questions are proprietary, but one question was, where is your human plasma using your product sourced from? Yeah, so these are all, the, the plasma is all sourced from FDA registered centers. These are all uh, US-based donors. All the sites are, are properly registered with FDA. And, um, and really ultimately during processing, one of, the, one of the issues that we often ran into with our AB was um, how many donors you could have per lot of material. And ultimately regulators were quite wary of, of lots that were too large without the appropriate you know, pasteurization or virus inactivation steps in the process. And so by shifting into a, an octoplast derived material, which is the, the, the pharmaceutical uh, human plasma that we use to manufacture our products, we're actually able to collect up to 1200 uh, plasma units per batch and actually through that pooling, reduce some of the, some of the impact that you might see uh, of antibodies ultimately on the ultimate drug product. So um, we're actually able to, to pool and make significantly uh, large batches to be able to, again, drive down COGS without impacting safety. Um, but again, the plasma source is always um, FDA registered sites in the US. Great. Um, the other question is, do you have um, R&D grade, grade plasmid services available for testing purposes or will you be uh, simply entering the CGMP plasmid service space primarily at the moment? Yeah. No, that's a, that's a good question. Um, ultimately, we will be working with, with research partners. And, and again, this comes back to Akron's business model, and it's been its business model from the very beginning, which is the space is still quite nascent. We need to work very closely with our customers to understand their needs. And our view is going to be very much to build out a preclinical space where we can manufacture uh, preclinical uh, material for customers whose requirements may not yet be in line with what a GMP uh, material might require. But ultimately, and this is something that, that's often easy to say and hard to do, ensure that one can translate what's been done on a preclinical front into the GMP compliant front. And so we are very eager and interested to work with customers that are still in that preclinical space that are not maybe quite ready uh, for GMP plasmid, uh, but that all, do have that long-term view. Uh, I think that, that that is critical for us. The long-term view has to be, we're trying to move towards GMP compliance eventually. Uh, we know what that implies, but this is where we are today. And so we'll work flexibly with folks to ensure that we can meet their needs today, but also have a view to what they're actually going to need in three, four years once they're in late stage trials. Great, thanks very much for all of that. It's very interesting. and. Uh... We all have to think about logistics, even with Allo, even though we're making a product ahead yes. of time, we still have a lot of logistical issues. Uh, and I'm glad you mentioned COVID. Um, it's, it's certainly clinical trials. It's challenging some disease, other diseases where um, you know, patients have issues and in terms of logistics and everything else. And it's even an opportunity in terms of a disease target. So it's always 50% empty and 50% full. Um, thank you. And I think.